Welcome to Impact Farming, where we introduce you to the people and ideas that will have a massive impact on your farming operation. Brought to you by Farm Marketer. Sit down, start the engine, and let's roll with today's show. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another segment of the Impact Farming Show. I am so excited to have David Speck today joining us. How are you, David? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me, Tracy. Excellent. I am so happy to have you on the show. So for those of you guys that are tuning in, we have David joining us, and he's the director of Global Family Business Institute at the Drucker School of Management. So we have a neat episode today. As you know, Dave, and as you guys know in the audience, we are, we're really honed in on a mental health series within our show that always focuses on farm business management. And Dave, I'm excited. We have, we have some farm business content. I'm going to call it farm business, self-management and mental health collide to make this episode. Is that About right, Dave? Is that what you figure? I I think you nailed it. Yeah, it's going to be a little bit of a mix of all. Okay, good. So I'm really excited for this. Before we dive in, can you tell our audience a little bit more about what you do? And actually, I need to throw in, I forgot one important thing. You are also the author of the book, The Firm Whisperer. So at some point, tell our audience about who we are. And I also want to hear about your book as well. So sure. So about six months ago, I joined the Drucker School of Management uh, to lead their Global Family Business Institute, and we are striving to become the meeting place for for generational family businesses uh, around the world. And prior to that, I was at a private bank, and I led the instruction of 2,500 advisors, really integrating the non-financial issues that families face when they're passing Uh, you know, a business or a farm from one generation to the next. Uh, Before that, I had my own consulting practice um, focused on family businesses and family farms. And I also taught at the University of Nebraska and developed their family business program. And that was really where the Farm Whisperer was born. Uh, I was surrounded by wonderful family farms and wanted to, rather than just consult one-to-one, was to try to put some of that um, into into a book that people could opt into and kind of do a little bit of self-help along the way. I'm a dad. I have six kids, Tracy, and I'm married and I live in Eastern Washington. So that's a little bit about me. Exciting. Thank you for sharing. So (laughs) let's dive in a little bit. And we kind of set the scenario before as we all know in the audience here, a majority of our audience is Canadian farmers. And I don't think I need to repeat to the audience what we're all going through. We've had some tough years, a really dry year. And I shared a little bit with you, Dave, before, and I think we really agree. If our farm business is strong, then it helps obviously with our mental health. And before we dive in, do you maybe just... uh, want to touch on your thoughts on where farm business management principles tie into the strength of the farm business and also mental health, how that can all connects in your mind. Do you want to go there right now? Sure. So, you know, I'm a believer that um, everything is connected. So in the work that I do, I talk about systems. And so if you're thinking about a farm, you have the farm system, which is the business of the farm. And then you have the family system, which is, you know, the the kids and the and the spouse and those two systems, especially in farming, uh, collide every day. And so there's needs that you have to fulfill as a as a husband or a wife. There's needs that need to be fulfilled as 
uh, you know, a father or a mother. And then you have these complicating factors of running a business at the same time. And I like to think of farming as one of the most complex industries to navigate this because most farmers actually live in their business or on their business. And so there's there's really, uh, you know, a struggle with with boundaries. And so in tough times like these, Tracy, it's really, um, you know, it, it really you know, kind of spikes because there's challenges in the in the farm operation, and those challenges come home. And there's no there's no boundaries between the work life and and home. And so, um, while businesses have struggled during COVID and and some of the other challenges we've been going through, you know, I'm I'm particularly uh, concerned with farm families because because of the lack of boundaries between the family and the, you know, the farm business. And so that's, that's something that I, I've spent a lot of time thinking about and we'll get into some of the ways that we can maybe help create some, some healthy boundaries, but also uh, focus on, you know, being intentional with what can we do within our businesses to, uh, you know, lighten that stress load. And then what can we also do within our families to, um, you know, to be able to manage through these challenging times. Okay, excellent. So I know the way we wanted to dive in, we have about three, I'm going to call them principles or areas, practices that you wanted to touch on and share with our audience. And I, do you want to go to the first one and talk about abandonment? Sure, we can go there. Um, actually, if we if we go to self management first, that that's where okay. I think we need to start. Um, sure. Because really, we cannot we cannot manage others um, until we know how to manage ourselves. And let me give you just a few examples there. This was something that Peter Drucker taught was the management of self, and he was really interested in looking at you know, what can you do from a time perspective? How are you, how are you managing your own time? How are you managing your energy? Um, so as we think about developing ourselves, you know, I'll use a farming reference of, you know, regularly scheduled maintenance. Um, as we know, good equipment uh, that functions well and is reliable is an absolute gift and a necessity in farming and in that farming operation. And if we think about ourselves as a valuable piece of equipment uh, and a vital to our farm's success, we might consider what are the pieces of regularly scheduled maintenance that we need. One of those is sleep. Uh, I think it's important that we look at our sleep patterns and we figure out how do we make that a priority? I know during harvest times, sleep is one of the first things to go. Um, But sleep is really important for us to be able to stay on an even keel. The other is just you know, proper, proper food and hydration. I know that if you're, you're away and you're, you're just kind of eating where you can, oftentimes that, uh, you know, that, you know, maybe we don't hydrate as much as we should. The the other thing is, um, you know, we need to take some time for ourselves and and that's usually, uh, you know, to kind of reset and, and, you know, if we can have some quiet time, which is hard to come by, especially during times like these, uh, whether it's to, develop ourselves to read up on new uh, processes or procedures or strategies that others are using. Uh, Sometimes just taking a pause from the busyness is something that helps us to reset. So those are just a few examples of what we might do for regularly scheduled maintenance of ourselves and how we manage ourselves. I love the way you phrase that. I think that will connect I'm going to be stereotypical, the men in the audience, much better than self-care. I don't think that resonates very well with men, right? Regularly (laughs) scheduled maintenance. I love it. Way to go. That's a good one. Okay. And you know, the funny thing too, I started Anthony, my husband, he's the main farmer. He's always go, 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 right? Hey, I have a headache, Tracy. Well, did you drink any water today? No. No. That might be why, right? And same thing, I, when you're self-employed, as farmers are, I said to him, I said, we need to look at ourselves as the main asset, right? Mm-hmm. When we're self-employed, everything is on our shoulders and you need to take care of yourself because farming's a long game, right? Absolutely. When you're younger, it's like, okay, gotta go, gotta go. But then you start to get a little bit older and you go, oh, whew, I gotta do this for 
quite a few more years, right? So yeah, kind of back, like to the, back to the equipment analogy. I mean, you can have a great piece of equipment, but if, if you're not checking the oil and topping it off, you know, at some point it's going to stop. And the same thing happens to us when we don't, uh, when we don't do that regularly scheduled maintenance. Love it. Okay. That is perfect. So self regular, I was going to say self-care. We're not using that word. I love that regularly scheduled maintenance. Got it. So the second principle, did you want to go into abandonment? When, when you told me about that, I'm like, Ooh, is he talking about abandoning the farm? I know we've had some bad years. <laughs> I just pictured a, a farmer getting in their truck and abandoning the farm. So I'm like, hmm, no, you better get no. into this a little bit here. <laughs> yeah, no, abandonment doesn't mean you're leaving the farm or you're leaving the family. Abandonment is really a principle, again, that back to Peter Drucker that he taught that we need to systematically be looking for things that we leave behind. And, and what that means in farming is, you know, it could be a, a pattern of, of how we've done things. It could be the crop that we grow. Um, you know, what are the things that have changed that we continue to do just because we've done them in the past? And so when you think about this principle of abandonment, what happens is, we always are looking for new ideas, Tracy, and we're always adding things to our plate. Sure. We're adding and adding and adding. So it may be that we are, you know, creating a product and then we're deciding to sell it, sell it direct to the market. Well, that may be new to us, but the question is, are we ever leaving anything behind? If we continue to just add and we never abandon something, especially things that aren't creating great value, but do take our energy and our time and our resources, um, we're just going to run ourselves into the ground. And so I think it's an important process that too few of us are actively looking for things to abandon and leave behind. Um, it's natural for us to honor the past and, and the way things our parents did things, uh, the way our parents farmed, but ultimately we have to take a look at what's working well what do we want to do in the future? And what should we actively look at leaving behind? Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. And you know, that's such a different take. It's so true. It, as farmers, entrepreneurs, we're keen. It's add, take on more land, take on more land. And meanwhile, we're just maxing ourselves out, right? And you're so right. When you, when you said that, it's like, oh, how often do we think of, okay, we're going to stop this activity or stop farming this or that because we brought this on, right? And we just max ourselves out. Everybody's tired. And then we all suffer as individuals, right? Yeah. Yeah. That is, that is the natural tendency, I would say, of the farmer in particular is, well, let's just work harder. Let's just work longer. Um, and ultimately, you know, the resource that is the humans uh, will break down if we're not systematically looking for things to leave behind. Love it. Okay, that's a great principle. And I'm so excited that you explained that because when I read that, I'm like, ooh, abandonment. What's going to tell our audience here? <laughs> I'm glad you clarified. Okay. So do you want to roll into uh, leadership presence on the farm? Would you like to go there now? Yeah, we can go there now. Um, what I wanted to say about leadership presence is, um, so we, we've recently engaged in a study on leadership presence, especially during the pandemic, and we've learned some things uh, along the way. One is... Um, you know, there's, there's different management styles. One is, you know, to dictate and just be a director. And the other is to include and, and listen and hear, uh, you know, the ideas of others. And then ultimately you have to make a decision. And so I'm, you know, there's this spectrum, I, I would guess with our farm friends that uh, they fall somewhere in that spectrum of director and dictator or inclusive and, uh, and really gaining the ideas of their employees and maybe even more important, their rising generation. And so what we've learned is, is you know, the way that you get buy-in, especially long-term, is by being more inclusive in, 
the idea phase. Now, you're not giving up control of the implementation. And especially when you are the owner, ultimately, you have to own not only the farm, you have to own the decisions. Um, but taking a more inclusive approach into ideas, especially if you have a rising generation that's coming back, they've gone and they've maybe worked somewhere else, maybe they've gotten some education at school, and they come back and they're eager with their ideas. And so ultimately, um, you know, whatever you can do to at least uh, hear them and help them feel like you're hearing them, incorporate some of their good ideas and, um, and allow them to take some management and ownership of those, of those ideas. And, and then you see if they work. So that, that level of inclusivity um, with regards to, to ideas and implementing some of those, I think is one key. Another one with presence is just um, defined as, as how are you showing up? And so in times like these, we can go back to that regularly scheduled maintenance. If you're not sleeping, if you're not uh, getting hydration, if you're not, you know, taking care of yourself, um, you're going to show up in a certain way, Tracy. And the, the way that you show up with your employees may not be conducive to them wanting to work with you or for you forever. And so that's something that we need to be aware of is, is our presence. And again, this is, this is particularly tricky with farms because we're, we're stuck playing simultaneous roles. So Tracy, I'll, I'll put you on the spot here for a minute. Oh, so you, you <laughs> play many roles in your own situation. Can we just talk about the many hats maybe that you wear or the many roles that you play in, in your own operation Okay. Or in your own family? There's oh, a lot, a lot of hats you probably wear. Look at you. You have nobody's ever put me on the spot before. No, I guess they have. So in my life. Okay. Wow. So two. Okay. I have two worlds going on. Let's put it that way. Yeah. I own farm marketer, the media company. And yeah. within that company, we are a Canada wide media company. We're large, but also as a main personality, if you want to call it behind the media company, I wear a lot of hats there. I'm CEO, yeah. I'm show host, I'm director of finance. I do some sales. I take care of my staff and probably about a dozen other things I do there. Right. So Tracy yeah. on the home front and farm, I'm not a mother, so I don't have that very, very busy hat to wear, but I am a wife and on the farm, I'm also business partner with Anthony on the farm, right? So all farm business decisions we discuss together and I am, we give ourselves titles. My audience is going to think I'm crazy here, but we give ourselves titles on the farm. Anthony's director of operations okay. and I'm director of finance. <laughs> It. And it's true. And those are the hats we wear. And obviously he has, he's the operator of the farm, but I do the farm finances, take care of that good stuff with him. So many hats there. I help out on a reduced level. Obviously I have like five full-time jobs with my own company, exactly. but I do help out on call it a part-time basis on the farm. That's me. <laughs> Perfect. That's a busy, that's a busy you. Yeah. Um, I love it. And, and you think about, you think about the roles that, that your husband plays too. He's wearing many hats as well. And, and as we think about, you know, our own presence, you know, are we showing up in a moment as a spouse or am I showing up in that moment as director of finance? And oftentimes yes. we're, we're taking off hats and putting hats on and, and sometimes when we, when we aren't clear in the role that we are showing up in, it can sometimes challenge our relationships. And so as at, for your listeners, you know, I would be thinking about, you know, how am I showing up? And then also maybe more importantly is think of others and how they're showing up. Are they showing up as, as dad in that moment? Or are they showing up as uh, president of the farm operation? And, and so we need to have a little bit of empathy for each other in the challenging role it is to wear multiple hats. And so from a leadership presence perspective, the question is, you know, what hat am I wearing right now? Yeah. So something to think about. You know, it's so funny that you went into that and I enjoyed being put on the spot. Funny thing is just yesterday I was thinking about how challenging it is 
to be in a, um, in a relationship, but also in business together. I mean, you, it's so amazing on so many fronts and you grow together and stick together, but same thing that you just nailed is in our relationship, there's the hard driving business, Tracy, yeah. that shows up as director of finance. Well, that ain't wife tra- Tracy, right? And that yeah. can, it, it's tough. And yeah, when you're out to dinner, how do you leave director of finance Tracy behind? You yeah. Know, or does director of finance Tracy come come to dinner with you? You know, and uh, these are silly things to think about, Tracy, but but they're they're real and they can add kind of some stressors to to the personal side, but also to the business side when you know you're connected with family and making business decisions. Yeah, they they really do. And you know, I I could probably speak to maybe even a more relevant one, equally relevant one, is the dynamic between the parents and farming children as well. And I so often hear, and I know from friends and family, how that dynamic goes, right? It it can put a lot of pressure. And you've worked with a lot of farm families and know a lot about that, but it's very hard, I think, for parents who have changed the diapers of a child and yeah. watch them grow and watch them make mistakes and watch them be silly as teenagers, watch them mature and to transition and treat them. If you're farming together with your children, I find that's a very hard transition for so many people is to start to mentor and treat your children as you would in a workplace. It's very hard yeah. to drive those boundaries, right? It is. It is. And oftentimes in farming, you know, when I was talking to my students at the University of Nebraska, I'll just tell you a quick story. I had one of them come in on a Thursday, big smile on his face. And I said, what's what's up? What's going on? And he says, my dad called last night and he was getting ready to graduate. And and uh, he invited me back to join the family ranch. And so I'm going to I'm going to join the rejoin the ranch when I go back. And I said, that's great. Um, You know, what's your role going to be? And he looked at me kind of dumbfounded, you know, like, I'm going to work on the ranch. What do you mean? What's my role? (laughs) Yeah. So I followed up again, Tracy. I said, well, you know, did you guys discuss compensation? How are you going to, how are you going to be paid? Well, he said, come back and we'll figure things out. Well, Tracy, who, who joins a business or takes a job when they don't know what their job description is and they don't know what they're going to be paid? This happens in agriculture all the time. And when this happens, when, and you're married and you're taking a spouse back to the farm and you go in with that level of uncertainty, you're going to have challenge. You're going to have some challenging situations. And so as you were talking about, you know, the generational issues, you know, communication, clarity, accountability is huge. And I think another challenge I would say that's probably happening in farming right now is, is just a level of, uh, transparency. So I'm guessing that there are many families, uh, parents in particular, who are bearing a heavy burden of knowing exactly how tough things are. And they're not wanting to share how tough things are with their kids because, Tracy, they're wearing the parent hat. Oh, true. And as a parent, you typically are trying to protect your kids from things that are going to hurt them, things that are dangerous, things that you know would would damage them, and so I think we face a we face an issue here generationally in this time where there's there's some burdens being born and and maybe there's a lack of transparency and so the the rising gen may not may not fully be aware of just how tough things are so hopefully that makes sense. That makes a lot of sense, you know, Dave. I'm glad you mentioned that because I never thought of that angle to that problem on the farm. I've chatted with a lot of guests and we hear about the parents keeping the cards close to the chest as they say, right? And I always thought that was maybe they didn't have a good grasp on the numbers, Yeah. whether they were embarrassed or uncomfortable, maybe because there was too much debt, they were scared of being judged by the kids or a control issue. I never actually thought about it from that parent hat. Oh my gosh, this has been three to four really hard years. 
And I don't want to burden the kids that, wow, last year we didn't make any money. And last year we actually lost money. I want them to stick around on the farm. So I'm not going to tell them how tough it's been. I never thought of that angle. And I guess maybe that's my not being a parent hat missing, right? But that is a, that is very insightful. Well, I think there's there's another challenge too with ownership. And, you know, when you have multiple generations, um, you know, whoever owns the farm, you know, kind of really has a full understanding of, of the debt situation. And if you have a rising generation coming in, in as as maybe a hired person, um, but they're not yet in an ownership role, you know, how, how can they be expected to have a full level of empathy for their parents when they really don't know the financial situation? So I'm a fan of, of more transparency so that that level of empathy and understanding of just how successful the farm is or, or isn't that year can, can really be known among across generations so they can start to act more like owners and empathize when things are really difficult. Ooh, clever. And, you know, I could see, cause I always, I've on multiple episodes, I said, I think I sit in a nice age where I can, I have a leg on both sides of the fence. As I say, I'm young enough to understand that burning hunger and that drive and the want to take over. And also now reflecting on how much you don't know at that age. And I'm old enough to respect the older generation where they're coming from. And where I wanted to go with that is if we aren't transparent, it's kind of like a bit of a vicious cycle, right? We want to protect them. But let's say I'm that eager Tracy, I'm 24 years old, I'm coming back to the farm and I come back and I go, geez, we're driving an old combine. It's embarrassing. That thing's horrible. Whatever the case is, I'm making up a scenario. Yeah. It's breaking down all the time. Dad, we need a new combine. And you know, you have a bit of that youthful ignorance. You don't know the numbers, don't have a grasp for the financials. You know what? Dad, mom are dealing with the actual reality. And because they don't want to tell the next generation, there's no transparency, they want to protect them. But then now they're getting bombarded maybe from the next generation. Why don't we expand? We need a new combine. So I could see those types of things happening, probably have been there and know of friends and family that go through that. Yeah, absolutely. And and in situations like that, I, I would take that opportunity to give that rising gen the opportunity to to walk through and figure out exactly what the numbers are on purchasing that combine and what that would look like um, on the balance sheet and how that would affect, you know, the overall performance of the operation and even go through the the steps of, you know, interacting with the lender. And, you know, those are all important things to learn how to do. And by just saying no immediately as a senior generation, you know, you may be taking some learning opportunities away while you're there to kind of, you know, still protect and help them make good decisions. And so I would take an opportunity like that to say, well, let's not say no to it, but we're going to have you do the, you do the groundwork on figuring out exactly what it'll cost, how we would pay for it. You know, do we have the cash flow to do it? And then we'll have a conversation with the lender and a great learning opportunity and it's uh, it's it's maybe takes a little longer than just a, a quick hard no, but uh, you know those are lessons that need to be learned. Clever, very insightful. I love the spin that you put on that. You kind of opened up a new train of thought for me as well. So thank you. Okay, so I think we've covered our three points. I'll give you the opportunity if you want to add anything. We can do some final thoughts. I do want to get you to talk a little bit more about your book if you want to, like some of the stuff that you cover in there, a call out. So I'll give you a section of time here if you want to add anything, and then we'll work to doing a call out on how our audience can connect with you and your work. That sounds great. Well, the majority of my work is really focused on, um, preserving families and perpetuating legacies. So the legacy might be a farm, it might be a business. And I say it in that way, Tracy, in that order for a reason, because family units are harder to build 
than farms and farms are hard to build. Um, but I always go back to the simpleness of, I call them my three C's and it's um, communication is the first one, uh, cash flow and continuity planning. So we can walk through those. Um, but ultimately any farm that's going to be successful has to deal with all three. And as we were talking about generational issues, you know, understanding cash flow uh, for the farm, understanding the cash flow for the for the generation that is maybe trying to exit and trying to retire. I mean, I, I put that in air quotes because farmers don't usually retire; they expire. Yeah. But, um, the cash flow needs of both the operation and the, the retiring senior generation are are really crucial. That second C of continuity planning, you know, needs. There's two prongs to that, Tracy. There's one is you know, the management. So you have a senior generation that knows how to run the farm. They have the, the uh, you know, all the relationships with the, the lender. They have the relationships with the vendors. They have the marketing. And ultimately, there needs to be some sort of continuity plan for transitioning those relationships to the rising generation. And then the, the second part of that continuity plan is with ownership. And, you know, how do you pass ownership? Um, you know, you could, I'm sure you've done full shows on continuity and uh, succession planning. So that's not necessarily for today, but um, the, the third one is really just communication. And I think, again, during a time like this, when things are difficult, I think it's important that the rising generation feel a little bit of the reality of the situation. And, um, you know, it's not comfortable, but it's the reality of, of agriculture. There's going to be some times that are great. And there's going to be some times that are really rough. And so I think shielding that from the rising generation is actually not, not doing them a favor. It's actually hurting them in their overall perspective of, you know, what it means to be a farmer today. So those are a lot of the things that I cover um, in greater detail in, in the Farm Whisperer. And uh, ultimately, yeah, my passion is preserving family relationships and perpetuating those farms. I love it. I'm so glad that I had you on the show and I'm excited. We're going to be having you back. Hopefully you're going to come back and join me in the next couple of months on our financial series. We're going to pick back up. I kind of took a bit of a pause as you guys know, as I told you, Dave, to really focus in on mental health and help support farmers as we go through some stuff um, in farming. I took a pause, but we're going to pick back up to our succession planning theme that I had for the year. And I hope to have you back on to dive into some of, yeah, that more succession and financial that we were talking about originally. So thank you. I'm excited. And really what I want to do, actually, if you don't want to add anything else, I'm going to get you to do a call out on how people can connect with you on social media or purchase and or purchase your book. Sure. So my book is available on Amazon. It's uh, I actually have two books. One is uh, The Farm Whisperer and the other one is The Family Business Whisperer. So you may have some family business listeners as well. Um, there's there's two different different books there. Um, you can get a hold of me on, on Twitter. I'm Family Businessman, uh, F-M-L-Y, Businessman. Um, and then my email address is david.specht, S-P-E-C-H-T at cgu.edu. So those are a few ways you can get a hold of me and you can Google me and, and find me too. So get old Google. And yeah. I will also include your details on the show page for this episode and a link to purchase your books and get you to likely Amazon. So if you guys are interested, visit the show page and that will be included in the notes. So Dave, it has been a blast. I really enjoyed this interview. You've brought some really neat, new, refreshing ideas here. So thank you so much for your time. Absolutely. I don't want it to end. Thanks, Tracy. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Dave. I Again, I really do appreciate you bringing your wisdom and sharing it with our audience and you guys in the audience as well. 
Thanks for joining. If you enjoyed this episode as much as I did, like it, share it, get it out there so people can hear Dave's episode and learn about his book and bring some wisdom to the family farm. So thank you guys. See you next week. Bye. You've been listening to Impact Farming. For more great episodes and articles designed to help you manage and grow your farming operation, head on over to farmmarketer.com. Don't forget to sign up while you're there. We will see you on the next episode. Oh,